Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off with discussion of RDNA3, specifically pertaining to a benchmark which has already appeared online for this upcoming graphics architecture. A few days ago, I outlined the targets for RDNA3 in terms of performance. That was an exclusive, along with the fact that the highest end SKU will almost certainly have at least 160 compute units, which honestly is kind of ridiculous. But another thing I discussed in that video was AMD's pursuit of relentless execution. Several people have told me now in the industry that the execution speed that AMD are delivering on CPUs and GPUs is nothing short of startling. Of course, with their CPUs, we saw Zen, Zen Plus, Zen 2, Zen 3, and they're already on track for future architectures. And we know that RDNA is very similar. RDNA 1, RDNA 2, and RDNA 3, and even 4 at the moment is in development. And of course, this is going to be continuing for other architectures like CDNA, which is focused on the data center. Getting back to the topic, though, yeah, there's a benchmark which has actually appeared online. So let's take a look. This benchmark, by the way, is courtesy of LeakBench, so full credit to them. And we'll go into how we think this is RDNA 3 in just a moment. Now, I'm going to skip over the... Uh, obvious thing of the name as we'll get into that in just a second but let's have a look at the rest of the system so it's a ryzen 5 uh 3600x it's a six core processor 32 gigs of ram nothing too extravagant there and even the performance results are nothing you know eye raising they're not awful or anything it's not like they're scoring five points but it's nothing amazing they're scoring 4800 points for the preset level and the frame rate is um 48, sorry, 49.5, I read that at 48 for just a second, with a CPU frame rate of 64. And you can see that the resolution here is 4K. So again, it's not an awful result by any stretch of the imagination, but it is still clearly very early engineering sample. So let's get into the name and why we think that this is RDNA free, as there is a couple of pieces of very compelling evidence. The first is that a while ago, we actually had seen what was called uh, Nishira Point. And this was actually an entry on the USB certification website. So why on earth would you attribute GPU and USB? Well, of course, the answer is that a ton of uh, GPUs now actually have a USB port on the rear. And this is for various uh, reasons, not least of which for powering, let's say, a virtual reality headset. But there is a couple of other reasons too. So... The first is that a very well-known leaker on chip hell, um, WJM47196, uh, you can see the headline, RDNA3, first exposure codename, Capricorn Superstar Nashira, codename Nashira MCM Design. And they've actually had a really good track record, by the way, full credit to videocards.com for that particular uh, link, but yeah. They've actually had a really good track record in the past with AMD, so I tend to give them the benefit of the doubt because they've been pretty accurate. This is not, of course, to say that anything's 100%, but they are pretty accurate. And the third reason, and this one I find also very compelling, is that the name of this GPU is Nishira Summit. And you'll notice that there is two entries here under GPU 1 and GPU 2. And typically, if you go to actually the Singularity Benchmark database or you run your own benchmark, it only detects a single entry. So, for example, if we run an RTX 3080 GPU 1, it will state RTX 3080, and GPU, well, 2 is nothing. It's blank because there is no second GPU. And the same thing, of course, could be said for an RX 6800 XT and so on and so on and so on. So this is a very consistent thing which happens GPU after GPU. Now there is always the possibility that they simply outfitted two of them in the system, which is definitely one possibility. However, it's also possible that at this point anyway, the drivers are simply just going, ah, what's going on? And detecting these as separate GPUs. Now the idea of RDNA 3, of course, is that we don't want uh, graphics uh, APIs, or at the very least the games themselves, to have to worry about programming around the notion of multiple GPUs. We know that multiple GPUs that we've seen, let's say with NVIDIA and the SLI support, it basically just disappeared. And this is for a multiple load of reasons. One, of course, the cost of owning high-end GPUs at the moment. Like imagine trying to buy to 6900 XTs, that's like 2000 US dollars. And that's assuming you don't have to pay the problems of, well, just shortages. 
but also, of course, heat output and all of that. But the real reason is just because of APIs. Basically, with DirectX 11 and also, let's say, OpenGL, it was a lot easier. You could um, abstract all of the work. And of course, the, the uh, GPU driver can do a lot of this. But keeping things really simple, that's not really the case with DirectX 12 or Vulkan. With DirectX 12, as we were detailing back in the day, DirectX 12, technically speaking, has some really good support for multiple GPUs. And you can do even explicit GPU. In fact, you can have GPUs and pair them up with entirely different vendors. So for example, you can have an Intel uh, discrete GPU and pair that up, oh, sorry, not a uh, discrete GPU, iGPU. I'm on Paul, get the terminology right. <laughs> but yeah, you could have an iGPU from Intel and pair that up with an AMD GPU or an NVIDIA GPU, or you could have an unholy alliance and you could have AMD and NVIDIA in the same uh, system. And in theory, that would work. And some vendors, of course, that works with. In fact, I believe, and this is from memory, so I could be wrong, so let me know in the comments, I believe Ashes of the Singularity is one of the more forgiving games with this, which might be one of the reasons that we're actually seeing this tested. Either way, to get to the point, this is not what we want with an MCM type of GPU. In fact, this is one of the harder things with um, designing an MCM GPU because you need the software and the, G and the actual architecture, the hardware, to work together in harmony. Bringing two chiplets together in harmony is going to be of critical importance because, of course, it allows you to scale up and make much more powerful GPUs. But yeah, there's a lot that, which goes into this as we were discussing in a recent patent. Basically speaking, you need GPUs, uh, the different chiplets, to also be aware of, for example, one another's caches and make sure that data parity is, you know, well, just works between the two. You can't have chip that A, for example, be working on old data. And of course, GPUs are naturally very high, highly parallel in, well, just the way they work. So my personal opinion is that AMD are going to be doing very well with this architecture. I'm hearing really good things. In fact, even before the performance targets that I recently was stating, even kind of mid to late last year, I was told that RDNA 3 was going to be pretty damn impressive. Um, at the end of the day, I would not, you know, count on anything until we've got it. And ultimately, that doesn't really mean anything. Like, a performance target is great. And even if they hit it, it's great, but it's of course going to be also down to what they are facing. And Nvidia's Lovelace is looking to be pretty damn monstrous. And I don't say that lightly. We're seeing over 70% improvement in just the number of CUDA cores. And yeah, we can expect that the clock frequency of this GPU for Lovelace is going to be significantly higher because the rumor is it's either going to be 5 or 6 nm. Personally, I'm betting 5 nm. Could be wrong, but... We'll have to wait and see on that one. And if it is 5nm, that gives them a ton of room to work and just in terms of clock frequency. Of course, it also does depend on other things like power draw and what other changes that NVIDIA make to the architecture. Um, I believe that they're going to have a much more robust cache system. I think it's going to be a lot more like we see with uh, AMD. And I think that also AMD will face a lot more pressure in terms of the ray tracing performance of uh, Lovelace. But again, from what I was stating, I think RDNA 3 is also going to be significantly more powerful in its ray tracing capabilities. So, too long didn't read, the next generation of GPUs is going to be extremely exciting. And if that's not enough, Intel are getting in on the action. We've actually seen discrete DG1. Yep, that's right, Intel are doing it. I'm going to read this press statement out because I think it's very important. Intel co-signed and partnered with two ecosystem partners, including Asus, to launch the Intel Iris XE Discrete Desktop Graphics, codename DG1, in systems targeted to mainstream users and small and medium-sized businesses. The cards are sold to system integrators, who will offer Iris XE Discrete Graphics as part of their pre-built systems. Following the launch of Intel Iris XE Max for notebooks, Intel's first XE-based discrete graphics processing unit Intel and its partners saw the opportunity to better serve high volume value desktop markets with improved graphics display and media accelerator capabilities. So this actually has two different variants. Um, the first is Intel Iris XE Max and the second is Iris XE. 
and these are 30 watts or lower. So the first unit is 96 execution units and the second is 80 execution units. And yeah, the bus is kind of minimal. It's only got four gigabytes of low power DDR4X memory, 128 bit memory bus, which is providing a grand spanking total of 68 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. So of course, this is not a GPU which is designed for 4K gaming or well, much of any real high, you know, kind of competition gaming or anything like that. But that is not the point, damn it. Until they've done it, they've released a discrete GPU. It's not DG2 which is the higher end. And I'm hearing some really interesting things with DG2. Um, a couple of people have told me that it might not see the light of day and instead we might see the next generation of XC for the higher performance GPUs. And I'm kind of getting mixed things on that because some people are telling me that Intel's graphics are doing really well for the discrete, but others are telling me that DG2 was kind of disappointing. So I'm kind of leaning towards DG2 not launching and instead it's going to be like the next generation architecture but honestly I don't know enough yet and so I'm just kind of holding fire. I really do hope that uh, Intel get in on the action as soon as possible and that we see a high performance GPU from them. I think if anything it's evident over the last what how long has it been there? How long have we been suffering shortages? I feel like I've got so much bloody trauma over just watching the shortages. I kind of don't want to think about it. But like, yeah, if we had a third competitor, let's say worst case scenario, let's just pretend, you know, let's do a hypothetical together. Let's say that Intel released, had a product on the market now. They released it uh, right now and it was reasonably available. That is not to say that you could easily buy it, but let's say it was reasonably available, say equivalent of the 5600X. And let's assume it was decently priced. It wasn't as fast as the highest end SKUs, and it wasn't supposed to be. It was not supposed to compete against NVIDIA's RTX 3090. Instead, it was more along the lines of an RTX 3060 Ti, something like that. I think that the market would be very thankful for it. Personally, I will remain on the fence until I get a product in my hands and I'm able to test it, uh, for gaming anyway. But Intel does have the technical know-how in-house and obviously they've made a lot of strides towards their drivers and all of the other components. And Intel are definitely changing as a company. Obviously they've got a new CEO, they're hiring new engineers again and yeah, it's going to take a while for Intel to compete anywhere near competently in the, GP, in the CPU arena against AMD. I don't think Rocket Lake's going to be it. I'm interested in uh, Rocket Lake just because, but I think for the um, high-end kind of performance desktop, I think Alder Lake has a good shot or at least the architecture after that. But for GPUs, it could be a really interesting uh, option for uh, competition. Again, I don't know if Intel will go for the highest end. Possibly, possibly, we will see them do much like AMD did with Polaris, if you remember back in the day. After all, Raja Kodori is there, and his tactic back in the day was to get AMD kind of competitive again on graphics with Polaris. And I remember when the RX 480 launched, there was a ton of excitement for the price. I think it was around 200, 230 US dollars, depending on the VRAM uh, configuration. It was monstrous, it was really good. Yes, it was not able to compete against cards like the GTX 1080, but that was not the point. It was a card which cost 200-ish US dollars and was decent in performance. It would easily play titles at the time at uh, 1080p and actually okay at 1440p as well. So I think Intel has a decent chance of doing very, very similar for its tactics here. And I'm actually really excited for that because again, I feel that this last year, certainly the last six months, have really shown us that we need as much competition as possible. We need as much availability as possible because ultimately it just helps us as end users. So I'm really happy that Intel XE, or at the very least DG1, is being released. 
well, I'll remain skeptical on DG2 until I actually get the product in my hands or whatever the gaming cart actually ends up being. But I, while I am skeptical, I am extremely hopeful that the product does actually end up being a product and more to the point, a good one. With that said, thank you very much for watching the video. If you did enjoy it, of course, you know what to do. You subscribe and click the bell icon because the land of YouTube, everyone. With that said, take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.